Hello, this is Life Questions, and I'm your host, Bill Harris. If you are looking for answers to life's many puzzling questions, don't touch that dial. It might surprise you to know that the Bible provides us with solid, down-to-earth answers and solutions to the many issues that we all face in life. We're so confident of that that we have amassed a panel of experts, local ministers, to address the many letters and emails you, the viewers, have sent us. And we want to provide you scriptural insight to enrich your life. So let's meet the panel. First, we have Mark Bird, who is pastor and missionary of Revive Ohio followed by Pastor Tim Benjamin of Wayne Street United Methodist Church. Then Pastor Rick Shear, Pastor of Living Hope Assemblies of God, St. Mary's. And we're rounding off the panel with Pastor Greg Fox, better known as the Hillbilly Preacher from Bluffton Trinity United Methodist Church. I would ask you why they call you a Hillbilly Preacher, but would it take long to tell us? <laughs> well, you'd have to ask him. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that long a story when... Uh, <clears throat> When we first started working with Revive, they, I always called myself the Hillbilly Center. Oh. Then I was called the Hillbilly Christian. And then after my time with Revive and some hard work by the good Lord, I became the Hillbilly Pastor. So that's the, <laughs> that's the story behind it. That. Very good. All he right. is responsible. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's dive right into this, gentlemen. We've got a lot of good questions here that uh, our viewers want answers to. Uh, first, we have one that deals with basically saying that... Um, some of the philosophies out there, the world say that we ought to let people go who don't make us feel good about ourselves, who don't make us feel good, period, uh, about life. And um, these are, are people who have philosophies that the Bible talks about that are not really closely aligned with the principles of God. What do we have to say about these many kinds of questions and how we should deal with those and put them into proper perspective? Well, I think one of the problems we run into is everybody today, I shouldn't say everybody, many people today see their lives as they're the star of their own sitcom and that everything that goes on around me is about everybody responding to me and living in my world and, and being a part of the <coughs> you know, like we see on sitcoms on TV. And I, I think, uh, you know, once somebody comes in who tries to upstage us or tries to take over our narrative or try to disrupt our vibe or, or ruin our flow or whatever, uh, we want to jettison those people. And I will say there are some times when a, a person will come into your life that you may think, I, you know, this is not for me. But on the other hand, uh, to just basically, uh, you know, get rid of everyone who, who doesn't, you know, automatically make you the center of their world, I don't think that's fair. And uh, so some of this advice about how, uh, you know, everybody has to be in your life and tell you how great you are all the time and, and give you a ribbon and, and a first place medal just because you're alive and all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure that's helpful because I, I, think, I think that does nothing but feed the narcissism that we see going on all over the place today where everyone is the most important thing and the winner and the champion and everything else, regardless of what they're doing. And I think a lot of the advice that we have today about if somebody doesn't make you feel good, then they're not worth having around. I think that's going to cause you to get rid of some people that you might want to keep around or who may need you in their life. But some, many times, we, I don't know that we look at it that way. Mm -hmm. See, Bill, that's a misconception we have. Um, it's not about our life and our little world or our sitcom. Yeah. It, the only one that really matters here is Jesus Christ and the Lord. And what we as people fail to re realize sometimes, and it's really made me who I am as a pastor, we have to go through some struggles. We have to meet and encounter with people, or excuse me, interact with people they don't agree with us and do things that aren't the same as we do. And those are part of the trials, some of the, some of the tribulations we go through. And that's actually what builds our character. And the good Lord doesn't tell us we have to agree with everybody. We don't have to like everybody. Well, we do have to show love to them. So there are times in our life where we meet people that we just have to, and for lack of a better term, agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. They might not be on the same page we are, but you know, God loves some people just as much as he does us. So, Bill, I'm wondering, when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, do we get to pick and choose our neighbors? Ah. Or do we love every neighbor that lives around us if it's just those who live around us? Uh, no. The answer is that we are to love our neighbor no matter who they are. And I, we don't get to pick and choose who they are, right? And Scripture tells us, you know, iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's not something soft. That's not something that, you know, agree with. That is something going against what we agree with that creates a sharp edge. 
and then both edges become better. So if we would, like you said, if we would eliminate them, maybe right. they needed us. Exactly. Maybe we needed them. Exactly. You know, and if we start doing that, you know, as as believers, as pastors, you know, we talk about mentors and things like that. Well, mentors are supposed to speak into our life, not right. just speak what we want to hear. Right. And so if we would start thinking on that point, then we would just eliminate everybody that could help us grow closer to Christ. That's excellent. And all they're going to do is bolster what you already are. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's change the subject. Uh, this is a good question that came in of an international flavor. Should Christians be pro-Israel? He says, I'm thinking yes, because the Bible says that the Jews are God's chosen people, yet global anti-Semitism is on the rise. And why is that? So what do you have to say about it? What, what should a Christian's position be about Israel? Well, the scripture says that they're God's chosen people. Uh, and again, it also says that God is God and he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God chose Israel. Currently, they have a veil over their eyes. They're not able to see the reality of Christ as the Messiah. Uh, but we are to treat them as brothers and sisters. Uh, our ancestry came through Israel. And so I believe that we should be praying for Israel. That's what I personally believe about it, that we should be praying for them as a nation that uh, God has his hand on them. And uh, just like any of our other neighbors, they don't necessarily always act like the way we think they should, but we should treat them as a neighbor and love on them. And so I believe that we should be praying and loving on Israel as well. They are certainly strategic. Israel is certainly strategic to the United States because of the democracy in Israel that exists there and the, the similarity in uh, values, values of life and the like. Some people talk about the fact that, um, of course, both the Arabs and the Israelis come from the house of Abraham. Right. And, uh, of course, that would be Isaac as the Israeli and Ishmael as the Arab. And, of course, Isaac having the true promise, as the Bible makes that distinction. But nonetheless, the Arabs are a part of Abraham's family. To that extent, it, it can get a little touch and go, can it not, when you're trying to be... Um, how I want to put it, diplomatic mm -hmm. to both the Arabs and the Israelis, but at the same time knowing that the Israelis are the true line of, of God's promise. How do you walk that thin line? You got to remember, if you look back through the Bible, there's many, many, many different situations where people have been chosen. <clears throat> and when they have received what they were promised, they went on to do things that weren't, weren't accepted by God or weren't right by God. And there's always been a way that he's brought that back around. Um, even with, with the, the situation in Israel now and the different things that are going on, I totally agree what's happening is, is not Christian based by any means. But I honestly believe we're all children of God. We have to treat them with love and care and we just have to have the faith that God's going to open the door at the right time and those people are going to come around and realize what's wrong and go back to his way of thinking. I think that comes down to that big word faith. I really believe. And the Bible gives us some hope telling us that in the last days the eyes of the Israelis shall be opened and they right. will look upon him whom they have pierced right. and, and recognize that he, he is the chosen one. So, but that's only going to be able to happen when conversation can happen and right now it just, right. I don't know if it can't or won't, I don't know which one of those is the right word, but it <laughs> isn't. You know, and, and that's going to be, be a problem because you can't negotiate with a, with a gun in your hand. And uh, so, so some, somehow conversation is going to have to be started, and I, far be it for me to figure out how that's going to happen. You know, how do, how do you negotiate a, a feud that's thousands of years long? But I just uh, think it's somehow we're going to have to stop killing and start talking, and that's the only way that's going to come to any kind of successful conclusion. I think so, you're right about that. Yeah. You're right about that. Any, any further comments on that one? Okay. What, um, let's see, I heard someone say, this is a question I'm reading from a viewer. I heard about someone who said he died and saw heaven and then came back. I am not sure I should believe in that. What do you think is what the question asks. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, the Apostle I, Paul writes that he was caught up into the third heaven, mm -hmm. right? So yes. it is possible. Uh, for that to happen uh, because it's recorded in the scripture that way. And so if um, I, I believe this, I believe that God wants to reach people. God wants to meet people where they are. 
and so many um, fears and doubts and questions are keeping people apart from God. And I believe that God could use a situation like that to draw people uh, to himself, to bring awareness back to him. Uh, and I believe that it can happen because it's a scriptural evident to do. And so I think that um, it is possible. Uh, I don't know that everybody who claims that to happen has happened to, but I do know that um, the, the scripture clearly defines uh, what that might look like. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested to know uh, what, what the question is here because the way this is worded, because uh, I certainly agree with what Mark said, uh, I think it's possible, mm -hmm. but is this person asking, is it possible that somebody went to see and came back? Because obviously Paul is an example, John in Revelation is right, an example, right. plenty of, of examples of that. So it could happen, but is the question, do I believe somebody could have an experience where they saw heaven and returned, or do I believe in heaven at all right. based on this mm -hmm. testimony? Because I, mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. know that I would agree with that. I don't mm -hmm. think this is the only kind of testimony we can have. So I, I, I am... You know, could, could there be an experience where somebody uh, got a glimpse? A absolutely, I believe that, but uh, I don't know that we want to base our, you know, our eternal destination based on a testimony like this. Great. All right, well, I think we've exhausted that question. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this viewer asks, do you feel that modern technology has helped the church or hurt it? I would assume, and this is a, my <laughs> assumption, that they're talking about the internet. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there are a few other things. I mean, the telephone. Goodness gracious, yeah. look how mm -hmm. obsessed we are with the telephone <laughs> these yeah. days. Yeah. Well, what about modern technology? How, how, how does it work for us as a church? I really think it depends on how you utilize that modern technology. Um, obviously, in some of our worship services, we've, we've brought in screens and projectors and, and music and, and different things that technology has helped us there that have appealed to other folks that sometimes don't like the other type, you know, the traditional style. Um, but I think the biggest thing is we're able to reach people all over the world <clears throat> through God and through our media. I mean, I know with the work that with Revival Ohio does, and, and I think we've all been involved with, um, we're able to, to, to gather as a, as a group and discuss things and share throughout the entire country, even actually the entire world, and be able to work together to spread God's love that way. And I believe if you use the technology at our disposal in the proper way, it's a big benefit to the, to the kingdom of God. I also believe that you can use it, just like anything else, to hinder the kingdom of God. And I think that's our job as pastors, really, to help guide that um, and not necessarily tell people what to do, but lead by example on how we utilize that, that, uh, that platform. I, I love technology as much as anybody here, except for maybe Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I really do, and my, and, my, and my church would say that I love technology. And yet, I would say the simple answer to that is yes. And yes, it has helped the church, and it has hurt the church. I think, I think um, as much as we can reach the world, we can also reach the world. Meaning that it gives an excuse for people not to fellowship with like believers and not to come and participate in what Jesus created, the church. Right. And because, of, oh, well, we'll catch pastor's message at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's something I struggle with because I do love technology. I love what technology can do. Technology brings a show like this. Mm -hmm. And yet I can see where it also hinders what happens in the church because it also creates the isolation of not being uh, believers, mm -hmm. not being with believers. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly exactly what I was going to take it. You know, obviously, uh, Wayne Street uses quite a bit of technology and, and not as much as we could, but we're mm -hmm. getting there. But but the idea is the isolation is the problem. Yeah. And I, I think if I was going to answer this, if you're talking about like projection screens and, and, and lights and, and guitars mm -hmm. and drums, you know, obviously, I think all that has helped. But when you're talking about uh, the 24 seven connection, I don't know that that's necessarily been a good thing for everybody, not just the church, mm -hmm. uh, because we now can just go, you know, we're, we're a society that can live in our pajama pants and sit, sit in the bedroom and mm -hmm. do anything we want to do. And I, I don't know that that's been good because I, you know, I watch kids in my youth group who I'm not sure they know how to speak to each other. Right, right. And that, that frightens me, you know, and I, I just... I, I worry about all that. So, so I, I kind of have two, two answers to this. The technology as far as social media, I think, I don't know that that's been good. 
Just, just mm -hmm. that's my thing. But as far as uh, you know, the modern uh, uses of technology and worship, I think has been great. I mean, people were talking about the instrument of the devil and all the stuff we're bringing to the churches, and they were talking about the pipe organ back in the day. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we we have been resistant to a lot of things, but yeah. we've found out how to make it good. So I think it's a mixed bag. A resistance, a resistance to change. Yes, too, right. Yeah, 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 believe it or not. Yeah. I want to well, just a little bit more. You know, for instance, um, when. Um, we now have a situation where some churches have uh, their services on the internet mm -hmm. and people can use that as an excuse to stay home mm -hmm. right. and I come. I want to explore that. We're going to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back and then we're going to look into that. We'll be right back. Don't leave. Okay? Goodbye. <music> Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Well, we're back and the camera should have been rolling while we were in that break because there's so much to talk about. Uh, I'm gonna let you just take, take off on this question here. The, we, we have situations now where some churches are broadcasting, uh, I don't say broadcasting, but going live on the internet right. with their services and some people use that as a convenient excuse to stay home when the Bible talks about the forsaking, not the assembling Some of yourselves much. as in the manner that some have. So. In terms of technology, this is a great technology tool, but is that part of it being used to hurt it, you think? Yeah, and so what I've experienced, because I visit different churches a lot, and so I've experienced, you, you look around at the congregation during the service, and many people have their heads in their phones. Now, the question is, are they looking up scripture? <laughs> Which is usually being projected on the screen nowadays. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or are they looking at other things being distracted? And I think there really is something about that. So I believe that the technology can be put to good use. And those people that uh, do broadcast services live, I think it's great for shut-ins and people in nursing homes and those sorts of people that cannot physically come together. But I think that we, like you just mentioned, Bill, I don't think we should get away from assembling ourselves together. And it says even more so as you see the day approaching yes, is the end of that right, scripture. Right. And I think what we need to do is, and I think one of the tools um, that, that technology brings is it's actually a tool in Satan's hand as well that pulls us apart and it takes us away from being in front of one another and being able to to connect with one another personally that and that's the important. piece right that um, can be bad yeah. you know Bill and, and I see that end of it our church we, we broadcast ours live on Facebook on our own Facebook page and we've had we've had as many as 500 people check in and check mm -hmm. it out we've had three families in the last six months that have joined the church from seeing it on Facebook Live, which really? we're tickled with. But a lot of the reason we started this was a lot of our congregation goes to Florida or South Carolina or Texas for the winter, and they wanted to be able to keep connected. Uh -huh. They wanted to know how they could do that. So we did it mainly for that purpose. It's a good thing. Um, they share their prayer requests. We have people in, in the area that are shut in. Um, they join our service and, and comment in on it. Um, our, our normal, how would you say, our normal congregation is there. Um, if they don't show up after a couple of weeks, we always reach out and make sure they're okay. Um, I don't want them to say, well, I've just been watching on TV. That's, that's not an excuse at our place. Right. But uh, really, we're hoping that it's used as a tool to bring it to the folks that cannot be there. And we mm -hmm. even have some families that I don't agree with, but their families have, the kids have practices and games and stuff on Sundays. Sure, yeah. And while they're there supporting their child, they are still checking in. So I, I think that's a good thing on that end of it, but I totally agree. It could give people an excuse not to. Mm, okay. uh, here's another question that has come in. I did not grow up in a Christian home, but accepted Christ as a young adult. I tried to witness to my parents and they're not interested. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how I can share my faith with them? There's a young adult that's concerned yeah. about their parents becoming Christians, becoming believers. The first thing we've got to make sure we're doing is, first of all, they're still our parents. Whether we're a believer or whether we're not a believer, they're still our parents. And then secondly, we've got to make it 
happen in natural conversation. Too many times we want to try to force the issue, right. mm -hmm. um, just like we try to witness. We try to force the issue rather just in natural yep. conversation. And then we don't use our testimony enough. We try to say, okay, you're going to hell and you're going to hell, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. And rather than saying, okay, this is what God has done for me. This is where God right. has brought me. And then I think too many times, especially in family situations, we don't live it out. With family dynamics and things like that, we all, when we all get together, we fall back into those ready-made roles that happened when we were <clears throat> children mm -hmm. instead of remaining the believer in Christ that we are. And too many times that breaks our witness. Um, and then, then the uh, adult or even siblings, I would go even far as mm -hmm. siblings, say, oh, they're, see, they're not any yeah. different. Why should I worry about it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about this comes from St. Francis who said, you know, witness to Christ at all times and when necessary, use words. <laughs> I, I think that's, I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, what we do <coughs> is going to be very much more important because, again, yeah, you try that aggressive streak. It's back to what we talked about earlier where you can't threaten or coerce anybody into a relationship, right. at least not a healthy one. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what we run into. And a big thing to remember on this too, especially in the family setting and with our parents and what have, if you take the whole family dynamic, as you say, falling back into our roles, who was the spiritual leader of our family? Normally it was your grandmother or your grandfather. Exactly. Okay, and I'm 56 years old, but grandma still rolls the roost when it comes to, to the religious side. I believe God told us to let them know us by our actions. Mm -hmm. you know, with our parents, that's the, way to, that's the best way to, to approach it. You don't have to go in and beat them over the head with the Bible, even though you'd like to sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but you do need to, to, by your actions, how you act, how you react, how you comment on things, let God be the guidance there. Right. And when he does, he's <laughs> going to open that door. And we make, a, we make a joke all the time on Revive Ohio about, you know, some people are meant to till the soil, some are meant to plant the seed, and some are to harvest. Um, we choose some guys in our group and revival how they're combines. They always, we do all the work and they come in and get the salvations all the time. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe our job is just to show that love, right. to work the ground and plant that seed. And, and maybe it's, it's Tim, Tim's job to come in and, mm -hmm. and, and be the combine. And we have to do the same thing in our family. But the goal is, is to get, get the person in relationship with Christ. That, right. That's exactly. the goal. That's the goal. You know, who, who gets to, to, to put the notch up on the board doesn't make any difference. Does not. Sure. And going back to the grandmother as being the spiritual leader of the family, you know, what did grandma do? Grandma prayed. Yes. Grandma prayed. Right and grandma prayed. Right. And we also have to make sure we're doing that if mm -hmm. we want to be a witness, not just to our family, but to anyone. Yeah. We've got to be seeking God's guidance in that. Isn't, that. isn't that the one thing that we seem to lack? I don't know if we feel that it's boring or whatever, but that deal of prayer, some of us are more content with doing. Like, like the Mary and Martha situation. Yes. 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 Martha yes. was more content with getting up and doing for Christ, well, as Mary knew the value of spending time with Christ. Um, what's to be you, know, you know what's interesting about that, though, is uh, <clears throat> later on in the Mary and Martha story, when Jesus waits and Lazarus dies, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then he's coming into town, Martha's the one that runs out to yep. give her a piece of the, give right. Jesus a piece of her mind, yes. right. and she, she was always the proactive one, and mm -hmm. that's kind of where we want to be. It's like Jesus, I had this all planned out. <laughs> you know, what was the problem here? <laughs> right. And, and I, I think a lot of times all that action is because we want to manipulate, because we want our our families and the people we love to be in relationship with Jesus, of course. Mm -hmm. And we want to manipulate that and say, look, I've laid it all out here. What is the problem? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, so, and sometimes, like you guys both said, uh, the idea is, is we got we got to let this happen on God's time, because if it happens artificially, it's it's not relevant. Well, well, well does it doesn't even happen. Or if it, it doesn't happens, happen at all. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If it happens artificially, yeah. you know, yeah. again, going yeah. back to that idea, you know, if we if we try to force it or we try to make it happen, we we're just messing it up. Yeah. The thing that I think the church today is missing the most is we've made it about church mm. we've made it about being a christian we've even made it about being a believer when we really need to be making it about spending time with christ in a relationship and that's what it's about and that takes time with christ yeah, <laughs> yes. that. right. and that's what we miss because yeah. we want to be we want to be the martha mm -hmm. you know and, and we do and that, that's the way society runs mm -hmm. Uh, the, the society as a whole wants to be the Martha. We want to do it for ourselves. I recently changed my mission statement to include the fact that my quality of life is directly linked to the quality time mm. that I spend in his yeah. presence. That's excellent. You mm -hmm. know, 
I, I had to do, I, I've got to keep reminding myself of it because I'm getting up doing, doing, <laughs> yeah. doing. But you yeah. gotta, you gotta get those orders, the marching orders, the direction, really good. and you gotta spend time with him to get yeah. that before you get out and go. Yeah. Otherwise, we're doing it in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Right on. What have we right. done as Christians? When we, and Mark tells you, if you give your life to Christ, you're, you're giving your whole life up. Okay. Right. Yes. What do we ask God to be our Lord and Savior and to take over our life? But we as humans, too many times, try to make that plan, try to make this person understand what you're trying to say it's his job we're just supposed to do what he tells us yeah. to do and you think about some of the great leaders in history like martin luther he said i try to pray an hour every day except yes. the days i'm really busy and then i pray too well even moses yeah. you know he he initially tried to go out and show brotherly love mm -hmm. by killing someone. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. it took him 40 years to See spend there. time with God. See there. You know, and uh, even as pastors, I think sometimes you, you talk about the busyness and, the, and getting hung up in that. I think we, we get hung up in that to the point where, and maybe this is just my church, maybe I'm the unspiritual one at the table, I don't know. But, you know, sometimes we make plans, we plan events, mm -hmm. and then, oh, yeah, let's ask God to bless it instead of, yeah. God, what did yeah. you want? Yeah, let's say start. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we make them after, after the fact. And, yeah. you know, right. he, he wants to be at the beginning of everything. That's, that's our humanity, though. That's, that's right. That's our humanity. God love us. <laughs> Listen, let me, let me deal with one more. We can squeeze one in here. This one says, I'm a new Christian and I want to learn so much, but there are terms I hear in church that I do not understand. Mm -hmm. He mentioned some of these terms. Three of them. One is being in Christ. You would think that that would be, well, you'd think that would be self-evident, but maybe not to a new Christian. A second one, being backslidden. And the third term, getting into the word. Those are the three, and he says, they don't make much sense to me yet. I'd like to touch on that, okay. Bill, we because about we talk that. about this a lot, okay? Uh, and, and it's this, it's the Christianese, mm -hmm. yes. right? And yeah, so what it go. does immediately, if you're a, a newcomer or a new believer, it immediately separates if you don't understand what that Christianese term is. Mm -hmm. It starts making people feel inferior or like they don't belong mm -hmm. or that, mm -hmm. wow, if I don't understand that, then I can't actively participate yeah, it and so it keeps people away and I, I always caution my team make sure we're not speaking those terms mm -hmm. that we alone understand and so just this question alone I bet there's hundreds and hundreds of believers in the same thing they're like well what does that mean mm -hmm. like and I talk about that like well what does hallelujah mean well we all say <laughs> it what does glory mean what does I extol you mean yeah. what does I exalt you mean Right? It's just those catch words and even discipleship. We talk about mm -hmm. discipleship, mm -hmm. but we don't use that term with new believers because if you don't know nature. what it is, it just alienates yeah. people mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. You know what the comments about that? Okay, well, we only have about 30 seconds left. Anyway, <laughs> that, nice way to end the show. Yeah, nice way to end the show. We want to thank you so much for being part of our panel this week as well as last week. I think we've gotten an awful lot out of you gentlemen that we can really glean on to go forward in life. Thanks again, and may God bless you. That's our program for today. Of course, we'll be back again next week with a brand new program, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Until then, may the good Lord bless you. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.